evening. My name is Grace Hayek, and on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library, I welcome you to tonight's webinar on Two Centuries of Deciphering Egyptian Hieroglyphics, presented by Foy Scalf of the Oriental Institute. Now, I would like to introduce our presenter. Foy Scalf is an Egyptologist who studies the intersection of people, materials, texts, and beliefs in ancient Egypt. His recent books include the edited catalog, Book of the Dead, Became, Becoming God in Ancient Egypt, through which an international team of scholars presented cutting edge research results on ancient Egyptian religious literature. In the 2020, 2021 volume, The Archive of Thotsutmus, the son of, son of Panopoulos, Son of Panufus, sorry, <laughs> it's hard to say. The Archive of Thotsutmus, Son of Panufus. Dr. Scalf and his authors investigated the administrative side of these mortuary practices through an archive of demotic texts that documented how ancient Egyptian funerary industry was organized. He is currently working on two catalogs of Book of the Dead manuscripts from the J. Paul Getty Museum and Williams College. He serves as the head of research archives for the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. Dr. Scalf, you presented at, at uh, Glencoe Public Library a couple of years ago, and it's really great to have you back. And I will now hand the reins over to you. Thank you very much, Grace. Thanks to you and also to the Glencoe Public Library for inviting me. And I apologize up front for making you say that awful title of our book, The Archive of Thotsutmus, Son of Panufus. Uh, that's uh, an Egyptian uh, name of a man who worked in the mortuary industry, uh, actually from the same period as the stone that you see on your screen. So thanks for inviting me, and I, I want to welcome everybody um, to this webinar. Now, just in this past year, uh, 2022, in Egyptology, uh, we have celebrated uh, what we could call a major jubilee season with several really important dates in 2022 for the history of Egyptology in general, the study of ancient Egypt, and also for uh, modern Egypt as well. One of those dates is probably well known to pretty much all of you, and that's in November 1922, when uh, Howard Carter and his team should also mention that not Howard Carter alone, he had a large Egyptian team uh, as well, uh, uncovered the tomb of King Tut. And so one celebration that we have uh, from the autumn of 2022 is the centennial of the uncovering of King Tut's tomb. The other major jubilee that we are celebrating in the autumn of 2022 that just passed is the decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphs uh, by the person you see on the screen here, Jean-Francois Champollion, when in September in 1822, he rushed into his brother's office and exclaimed, I've done it, and announced that he had deciphered Egyptian hieroglyphs. And as legend has it, he then passed out from exhaustion and stayed in bed for the next five days uh, recovering. Following this announcement to his brother, just about two weeks later, September 27th, 1822, Champollion read his famous paper before the Academy um, announcing this major breakthrough. And then in October 1822, this paper was published as the very famous letter to Dossier, um, sort of announcing this decipherment to the scholarly world. Of course, at this point, uh, this letter only has the sort of tip of the iceberg. And he has much work to do after that, which we'll talk about later tonight. So 2022 represents for us the centennial of the discovery of King Tut's tomb or the uncovering of King Tut's tomb and the bicentennial of the decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphs that we're still currently celebrating. And this is a worldwide celebration, as you can see um, from, for example, at the Champollion Museum in Fijac in France, where Champollion was born. They have an exhibition about the decipherment at the College de France in Paris, they have an exhibition about the decipherment as well as an accompanying catalog um, about this uh, that has some interesting articles that we'll mention later in this talk. Probably the largest and most uh, well known of the current exhibitions is going on currently just for a few more days at the British Museum, Hieroglyphs Unlocking Ancient Egypt. And I really do highly recommend the accompanying catalog. If you were not able to go to the exhibition, the accompanying catalog is available and it includes a very nice overview, wonderful pictures, and you can really get a good sense 
of the decipherment, both before, during, and after, and also some, some later approaches um, from uh, modern Egyptian viewpoints as well that was included in that. And this exhibition was actually just reviewed uh, this week in the London Review of Books. And I thank uh, my friend Hillary for forwarding this article over to me. So if you want to read about the exhibit before you get the catalog, you can read about it in this uh, article. And finally, there's another exhibition at the University of Liège uh, where they put on an exhibition, in fact, focusing on what happened before Champollion's decipherment. So approaches to Egyptian hieroglyphs from classical antiquity, basically up to the Napoleonic expedition uh, invasion of Egypt in 1798. And I also uh, recommend highly this catalog. It has lots of really fascinating um, material in it, including a wonderful catalog uh, section about early approaches to interpreting ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs prior to Champollion's decipherment. It's really an interesting catalog. Uh, unfortunately, right now, only in French, um, but maybe an English translation will become available. Now, of course, at the core, at the center of all of this excitement, of all of these expositions uh, and ex exhibits and catalogs, is one particular stone. The stone that we now know uh, by the name, the Rosetta Stone. And one thing I want to point out before we begin to talk about the decipherment is how flexible and symbolic the Rosetta Stone has become. It's been really appropriated by pretty much every uh, cultural group uh, in various times and places for whatever symbolism they need. Let me show you what I mean by looking at some of this um, some of these ideas of the Rosetta Stone as a symbol uh, being appropriated uh, today. So on the one hand, the Rosetta Stone is an international icon, and as I mentioned, it has all of these different meanings to different people. In one way, you can say Rosetta Stone now, right, and just mean a generic reference to anything that cracks codes, right, or reveals something that's hidden. And we can see this in lots of different features. I just show you a couple of examples. Here's a book, The Earth as a Distant Planet, a Rosetta Stone for the Search of Earth-like Worlds, right? So we're using this term Rosetta Stone as a moniker for something that reveals things. Here's another book about robotics research where they say, we envisage, envisage manual uh, intelligence as a Rosetta Stone for robot cognition, right? So now we can just invoke the Rosetta Stone in all these ways. Likewise, as I'm sure all of you are aware, the Rosetta Stone has been adopted by the business community as the name of one of the leading language learning softwares uh, that's used throughout the globe. The Rosetta Stone, again, a device to learn languages or crack codes. And we can see this popularity sort of wax and wane of the use of the term Rosetta Stone. If we look at something like, this is Google's Ingram viewer, where you can look at the number of uh, occurrences of a particular word or phrase in books that the Google project has scanned. And you can see how popular this was in the early uh, 2000s and late 1990s, this sort of peak of use of the term Rosetta Stone. Notice that this, <laughs> this ends in 2019. So we will have to check back in a couple of years to see if this is rocketed off the charts with this bicentennial in 2022. But the popularity of this term in all these different contexts, I just want to point out to a younger generation who may not know uh, yet about the real Rosetta Stone, it's quite possible that they hear this phrase and they don't even know that this refers to basically a chance discovery of a remarkable looking rock in Egypt, right? So on the one hand, this symbolism sort of um, outshines the Rosetta Stone itself. And perhaps one of the most important ways that the Rosetta Stone has served as a symbol as, as a cultural icon and a symbol of nationalism for modern Egyptians today who see this as part of their cultural heritage and their, their shared national heritage. And of course, this has uh, been sort of at the base of calls for the repatriation of the Rosetta Stone back to Egypt uh, from the British Museum. And if you want to learn more about some of these um, approaches and about some of the modern um, Egyptian viewpoints on this, I highly recommend the lecture that I have here on the screen by Heba Abed El Gawad, uh, where she talks about which Rosetta and talks about the shifting meanings of the Rosetta Stone to different communities. And so this is obviously a very important one that's very much part of the discourse right now 
in terms of who should own these objects, where should they be displayed, um, and where they, they have their rightful belonging. So what we can see then, just by this very brief sort of set of examples, is that the Rosetta Stone represents many things to many people. When it was discovered for Napoleon's soldiers, this really reflected or represented for them political hegemony, right? Their sort of invasion and capturing, quote unquote, of Egypt, uh, specifically from the British, right? They wanted to cut off the British from India. So this was a very strategic political invasion. And it also represented them to them scientific discovery. And we can see that kind of symbolism in some of the materials that the French later produced, like this medal that you see here, where a French soldier is uncovering a female symbol of Egypt. You can see she's holding the symbols of Egypt, a crocodile, a sistra, etc. So he's sort of unveiling Egypt for the world. Or if we look at the frontispiece to the Description de l'Egypte, the Napoleonic um, publication, where we see etchings, uh, sort of many of the monuments of Egypt st stuffed together, devoid of any of their modern inhabitants or other uh, modern surroundings, right? So this uh, represents for the French, this sort of scientific discovery and political hegemony. But of course, the stone today isn't in France, it's in England. And so for the English, this is really a representation of uh, uh, their military victory and political victory uh, over the French in 1801. And the stone today actually bears physical scars of this um, of this situation of Egypt being caught between these two imperial powers, uh, the French and the British. And on one side of the stone, it says captured in Egypt by the British army, 1801. And then on the other side, presented by King George III. So for the British in 1801, this was sort of a symbol of their victory. Now today, one final thing I, I would like to mention, of course, is that museums, the British Museum per, in particular, but museums all over the world, as you could see from those exhibitions and catalogs that I mentioned earlier, see the Rosetta Stone very much as a tool for cultural engagement, right? This is a way to bring people in to ancient Egypt, ancient Egyptian language, but not just language, but the thoughts, feelings, desires of the ancient Egyptians themselves. As I'll come back to at the end of this talk, you know, the decipherment of hieroglyphs gave us at least the option, the possibility to hear the ancient Egyptians in their own words uh, for the first time in over a thousand years. So this is um, really seen now in museum, in the museum world as a cultural gateway uh, to get into and, and build an empathy with uh, the ancient world. So again, just to recap what we're talking about, the Rosetta Stone as a symbol, it's been seen as a decoder, a marketing tool, a national and cultural icon. It's symbolic of colonial attitudes, of conquest and imperialism, of discovery and science, and even cultural engagement. But all of these things answer the question, what is the Rosetta Stone today? And I think maybe the first thing we should talk about is what was the Rosetta Stone when it was actually created back in the second century BC. So the Rosetta Stone was made as a decree of the king who's named Ptolemy V. So after Egypt was conquered by Alexander the Great, one of his generals took over Egypt, a uh, general named Ptolemy, and then the descendants of Ptolemy, who obviously had the name Ptolemy as well. So we put numbers after their names, and they had a number of epithets that distinguished them. Um, they ruled Egypt, uh, and they're from Macedonia. So they have a uh, background, an ethnic background in Macedonia, and they're ruling Egypt. And this King Ptolemy V, whose epithet is Epiphanes, so Ptolemy V Epiphanes, he is the one who's responsible for this decree, and it was issued in 196 BC. Now, you should just know that when this decree is issued by Ptolemy V, he's still a teenager. He's just come of age and was just able to sort of take the coronation and take the throne, uh, and his... Um, he was sort of being handled um, by people behind the throne, sort of handlers who are who are sort of uh, vying for power behind him. So he issues this decree, um, Ptolemy V in 196 BC. One of the major uh, events that the decree is celebrating is the quelling of a revolt against the Ptolemies in the northern section of Egypt in the Delta. In fact, there's revolts throughout e Egypt uh, against the Ptolemies. Uh, and so they were still ongoing at this time in the south, but this particular decree on that's written on the Rosetta Stone uh, 
is celebrating at least partially um, the quelling of the revolt in the north in the delta. Part of the decree offers financial support for the temples, including uh, increased priestly stipends, reduced taxes, amnesty for prisoners, etc. And in return, uh, the Ptolemies are going to get uh, basically extra cult veneration in temples throughout Egypt, where they're going to celebrate both the king's birthday and the king's accession day each month. So each month they're going to celebrate the day of the month when the king was born and the day when he took the crown, when he acceded to the throne each month. So for the Ptolemy and all the Ptolemies in general, I'll talk more about this in a second, these decrees served as political propaganda. And it was part of their negotiation with the powerful uh, Egyptian priesthood um, to increase their legitimacy throughout the country, right? The, basically, the Egyptian priesthood were sort of the middle men, the middle group between uh, the ruling house of the Ptolemies and then the Egyptian population. So this really served as political propaganda for them. Now, the revolt that's discussed in this um, decree has recently, in the last, uh, let's say, 15 years or so, uh, been discussed because archaeological remains of destruction layers at a site called Tel Tamai um, have been connected with this particular revolt. So you can read about this online in a number of um, fairly recent articles, like I said, the last 10 or 15 years, uh, and one very recently, that have found evidence for destruction in the North from where the Ptolemies went in and quelled uh, this, this, this revolt that's mentioned in the Rosetta Stone. Now, the stone itself, as all of you probably already know, is inscribed with three different scripts, the hieroglyphic script at the top, the Demotic script in the middle, and the Greek script and language at the bottom. Uh, the two scripts at the top, hieroglyphic and Demotic, they're basically both a, a script for the Egyptian language. But we also use Demotic to refer to the phase of the Egyptian language that's contemporary with when the Rosetta Stone was made. So in the second century BC, Egyptians are speaking and using on a daily basis what we call Demotic, a phase of the ancient Egyptian language. Whereas the hieroglyphs at the top were actually written in uh, imitation of a much more archaic version of the Egyptian language that we call Middle Egyptian, which goes back to roughly 2000 BC, and they're still imitating it here uh, in the hieroglyphic script. Now, the sort of um, key component that was recognized right away, not necessarily in the Egyptian, I'll talk more about this uh, in a few minutes, but even in the Greek translation, these are all translations of the same text. But what we have at the end of each of these inscriptions is what was supposed to be done with this decree. And so the text tells us that this decree shall be inscribed on a stela of hard stone in sacred, that is the hieroglyphic script, in native, that is the demotic script, which is also um, sometimes, especially at the time of Thomas Young and Champollion, was referred to as incorial, meaning of the countryside, and then and Greek characters. So this is what the stela itself tells us. Uh, should be done with it so that this was going to be inscribed this decree in these three different languages let's say three different scripts and promulgate it throughout the country and the word that's used here when we say a stela of hard stone in the egyptian of course refers to what we have the stone itself now the rosetta stone itself is only a partial fragment of a much larger stone so as you can see in the left hand picture here and in the drawing in the center recreations or reconstructions of the Rosetta Stone is a much larger monument. And in fact, we only have a very small portion of the hieroglyphic text from that decree, at least from this copy. I'll talk more about that in just a second. And so what you can see on the left is one of these reconstructions that would reconstruct roughly what it would have originally looked like. So you can see at the top, there's a scene and I'll talk more about these scenes in a second, but here, a scene of the, the king and queen before other deities. Uh, and then you would have had the hieroglyphic section, the demotic section, and the Greek section. So, And notice we have a round top stela, just like the word for stela in the Egyptian hieroglyphic text here, what we call a determinative, a little sign that goes at the end of the word that tells you the group or the semantic class to which the word belonged for the word stela, which literally just means a thing that stands up. That's what the word means. So we have a standing stela with these inscriptions. But what you should know is that the Rosetta Stone is just one copy of a decree 
for which there were many other decrees similar to it. So the Rosetta Stone in this uh, decree from 196 BC is just part of a longer tradition of these types of decrees, most of them, or many of them, I should say, being trilingual, right? So hieroglyphic, demotic, and Greek. And so here are just some of these other Ptolemaic decrees. We often refer to these as the sacerdotal decrees, that is the decrees that were put out by the Egyptian priesthood. The priesthood came and met, and then they put out this decree after their meeting, which is often called a synod. So we have one from Mendes, we have one from Alexandria, you can see the dates next to it, uh, the Canopus Decree, the Raphia Decree, notice the Memphis Decree, 196 BC. So another way that we refer to the Rosetta Stone, or, or the decree that's written on it, is by the Memphis Decree, because the priests came together and met in the city of Memphis. And so we often refer to this not just as the Rosetta Stone, which is just one copy of this decree, but as the Memphis decree, because that's where uh, the priests came to meet. We have decrees from Philae and then Nobira. I'll come back to this uh, a little bit later because it's important for the Rosetta Stone. So the Rosetta Stone and the decree on it is just part of a long tradition of these Ptolemaic decrees. Here's a couple of pictures of some of the other ones. The one that you see here in the middle, this is the Canopus decree. So if we go back to our list from 238 BC, Notice that this reconstruction of the Memphis decree of the Rosetta Stone, that the upper lunette is based on the Canopus decree of Ptolemy III. And we'll come back to um, more recent research on that in a second. And then here on the right, you see the Ptolemaic decree, uh, the Raphia decree from Ptolemy IV. And you can see here Ptolemy IV, he's on a horse holding a spear, spearing his defeated enemy, uh, here representative of the Seleucids who he's defeated in battle and at Raphia, which is why we call it the Raphia decree. So things uh, like these decrees, they have a lot of similarity with the decree on the Rosetta Stone. So just to take one example, if we look at the Canopus decree, it's a decree of Ptolemy III. So um, two predecessors before Ptolemy V of the Rosetta Stone. It establishes, again, benefactions uh, on behalf of the royal house for Egypt and the priests. It increases the priestly rotation, in this case, to five groups from four. Um, it celebrates the Ptolemies in the, the temples throughout Egypt, just like the Rosetta Stone. And again, it's inscribed on stele throughout the country in hieroglyphic, demotic, and Greek. So you can see this is a running theme for the Ptolemies. So the Rosetta Stone while we tend to think of it as this really unique object, we now know that this was fairly common. And there would have probably been hundreds of copies of these decrees uh, in the Ptolemaic period. So let's say from 305 BC to 30 BC, that would have been made and put in temples all throughout Egypt. Just to look at another one, this is the Raphia decree again of Ptolemy IV, issued after uh, his battle against the Seleucids and his victory. And again, increases honors for the Ptolemies in the temples throughout Egypt. Now, there's a connection with this decree in a way to his successors, the Ptolemy V decree on the Rosetta Stone, because notice what um, Ptolemy IV is doing here. He's on horseback and spearing his defeated enemy. Well, if we look at the later decree um, of Ptolemy V, the Nubaira decree, here you can see on the actual decree itself that we have Ptolemy spearing an enemy, and the text of this decree is very closely related to the one that's on the Rosetta Stone. And so now, today, scholars have reconstructed that the upper portion of the Rosetta Stone, which is now missing, probably didn't have a scene on it like the Canopus Decree of Ptolemy III, but actually probably had a scene on it like the Nobira Decree. So this is how that upper portion has recently been reconstructed. This appeared in um, Friedhelm Hoffman's and uh, Stefan Pfeiffer's book on the Rosetta Stone, and it also appears in Ilona Rogulski's uh, catalog that just appeared for the British Museum. So this is representative of now what people have reconstructed as that upper scene. So just to sort of summarize again, we have a decree of Ptolemy V. It's issued after the partial quelling of a revolt, and it gives benefactions to the priest, and in return, those priests are going to promulgate the Ptolemies with statues in the temples next to the god statues throughout Egypt. Now, as I mentioned, we actually have multiple copies of this decree, not just the Rosetta Stone. So the Rosetta Stone, which was found in the modern city of Rashid in Egypt, that was the first one discovered 
But now we have the Nubira stela that I showed you from 1884, a stela from Elephantini that was discovered at the beginning of the 20th century, and then a stela from Tel El Yahudia that was uh, discovered in 1922. These are all individual copies of the same decree from different places. So we have these different copies where they were put in different temples uh, throughout the country. Um, so the Rosetta Stone isn't even our only copy of the Memphis Decree. It's just our most famous one and the, and the one that we found first. And of course, that was so important in the decipherment. So uh, Ptolemy V really, uh, released further decrees. Um, at Philae, we have a couple that we call the Philensis Decrees. Uh, and this was really um, decree celebrated the final quelling of the revolt in the South. So it's connected to the Rosetta Stone Decree because the Rosetta Stone Decree celebrated that quelling of the, the revolt in the north, and then this Philensis decree um, celebrated the final quelling of the revolt in the south uh, at a time when there was even native Egyptians who were claiming to be pharaoh in the south, and even inscribing things, uh, Egyptian inscriptions with Greek characters uh, at temples in Abydos uh, at this time, but Ptolemy V um, puts down those, those revolts. So this is what the Rosetta Stone was in ancient Egypt, right? So in when it was made, it was made as one of these Ptolemaic sacerdotal decrees. And even though now the Rosetta Stone has taken on this other life, and we know it in all these different symbolic ways, in ancient Egypt, it was part of these royal decrees that basically served as propaganda for the, for the royal house and for a way for the Egyptian priests to also reinforce their own authority. Now, the Rosetta Stone, in terms of its discovery, Part one that I would like to say is if you want to discover the Rosetta Stone for yourself, um, any of you who are in the Chicagoland area, I would recommend that you come down to the Oriental Institute where I work. By the way, my virtual background is our library where I work at the Oriental Institute. But in our public galleries, uh, in our Egyptian gallery at the, at the OI, there's actually a cast of the Rosetta Stone. So if you want to come see what these... Um, text look like and at the original size, you can come and see that in our galleries. But of course, that's for you to discover on your own time. The original discovery came after Napoleon Bonaparte's uh, invasion of Egypt in 1798, where again, this was a very strategic invasion um, where he's sort of plotting against the British. He's trying to cut the British trade route off from India at Egypt. Uh, and also, Egypt is a very important symbolic uh, country at the time. This is what he said to his troops. We must go to the Orient. All great glory has always been acquired from there, right? So there's this sort of what we would call now maybe an Orientalist stereotype uh, that he's giving to his troops to sort of fire them up. So when Napoleon invades in 1798, he's initially uh, very successful in his battles with um, the um, – let's call it the Ottoman forces um, that are there. Um, of course, his success doesn't last very long, but in 1799, he has his troops working on building up fortifications in the Delta area, uh, right near the Mediterranean Sea where, where they came in on their ships. And this is where the Rosetta Stone was discovered in 1799 at a site called Rashid which that's where the French name Rosetta derives from, uh, the modern uh, Arabic name Rashid of the site. And the site is located here. You see it in the red little pin that's dropped in, in the map on one of the Western branches of the Nile as it flows into the Mediterranean. We'll sort of just take another look. So here's Rashid on this branch flowing in Alexandria to the West. And here's the actual fort that it would fa found in now known as Fort Julian, uh, the fort, uh, the fortifications that Napoleon's soldiers were actually building up. Here's just another view uh, that you can see where this fort's at uh, on this branch of the Nile, and it still stands today. Here are uh, the walls of parts of this fort as they look today. And not only does the fort still stand today, but there's even still other reused ancient Egyptian monuments that are still part of this fort. And you can see this one marked by uh, a placard describing uh, the stone that's been placed here from some ancient Egyptian monument that's been reused in this fort. And this is exactly the type of reuse that the French soldiers discovered when they discovered the Rosetta Stone here. So it had been reused in a, in a much later monument. And as they were sort of cleaning up the walls and fortifying uh, Fort Julian, they discovered this stone. 
Now, the traditional story has it that the stone was discovered by Pierre Francais uh, Xavier Bouchard, and he's a lieutenant and engineer in the French army. He joined the Institute of Egypt. So this is the institute that um, the savants, as they're called, that is the engineers, the mathematicians, um, the um, the artists that are brought along with Napoleon. They, they form a little institute uh, in Egypt based on the Institute of France uh, back in, in, in France. And he joins the Institute of Egypt, and he makes this discovery in mid-July 1799. Now, the picture you're looking at is not of Bouchard. <laughs> I have not been able to find a picture of Bouchard. This is a picture of a friend of Bouchard who's named Nicolas Jacques Conté. And both Bouchard and Conté, what's uh, maybe interesting about this picture is they both had severe damage. In fact, Conté lost uh, his eye and Bouchard had damage to his right eye when they were in um, an explosion uh, related to balloons that they were um, that they were trying to work on uh, to do surveying work. Um, and Conte was actually the one who recommended Bouchard um, for Napoleon's Egyptian invasion. And when the stone was found, among other people, Conte was one of the ones who used the Rosetta Stone as essentially a lithographic printing block to make copies of the inscription on the stone so it could be sent back to France. That is the copies sent back to France. So it's discovered by this French soldier in um, July, 1799. And although there's different versions of the story, pretty much right away, the importance of the stone was recognized. The three scripts that were on it, um, and more importantly, you know, many of these savants, right? Many of these uh, individuals um, could read the Greek. And of course, the last line of, or the last couple of lines of the Greek tells us that the decree should be promulgated in hieroglyphic, demotic, and Greek. So really very early on, it was known to be a trilingual inscription and people recognized immediately that this could be important for trying to decipher uh, the ancient Egyptian language. So prints were made of it right away. Here's one of these prints that were made actually using the stone itself. The stone itself was inked and paper was pressed against it. So again, they're using it sort of as a lithographic stone. Um, and then these copies were sent back to Europe, sent back to France um, in order for people to start working on them and see what it could tell us about the ancient Egyptian language uh, or otherwise. Now, when um, the British followed the French and invaded Egypt right behind them in 1801, the French savants, when the, the, the French were defeated by the British, they tried to keep the Rosetta Stone and hold on to it, along with a lot of other antiquities and their notes and everything. Um, but the British allowed the savants to retain possession of their notes and their drawings and their papers, but they did not let them retain any um, control over the antiquities themselves. So after the discovery, you know, less than two years later or so, um, the Rosetta Stone was taken uh, to Britain after this French defeat and the capitulation uh, after the Battle of Alexandria. And this is where it gets those marks that we talked about before, presented by King George and um, captured by the British 1801 that are on the sides of the stone itself. And pretty much ever since then, the stone has been on almost a continuous display uh, in the British Museum in one way or another. And of course, it forms the centerpiece of the current exhibit that they have on display there now. The stone did, however, because those savants, those uh, artists and mechanics and engineers uh, were able to keep their notes and drawings. The Rosetta Stone did appear in the description de l'Egypte when it came out uh, in several plates in the back uh, in drawn form. And when people were working on the Rosetta Stone, trying to use it for a tool for decipherment, all of these different tools were important um, because certain copies were more accurate than others. Some people had access directly to the stone. So if you're in England, like Thomas Young, you had direct access to the stone while others did not. And all of these different copies would play different roles in trying to get the most accurate copies of the inscription so you can compare across them and start identifying uh, elements in the Egyptian scripts that you could link up with stuff in the Greek script that was on the stone. And that was how this initially started. And one important point I hope you take away from this presentation tonight is that Champollion didn't do this alone. 
he had predecessors. And tonight we only have an hour. We can't get too deep into the earlier predecessors. I mean, there were already scholars writing in Arabic who were guessing at some of the sign values, you know, in the medieval period. There were classical scholars who were um, who either could read hieroglyphs and their works were lost, or later they had some inklings about it from Egyptians. And this carried on all the way, you know, through the medieval period into the early modern period. But we don't have time to go over all that today. If you want to talk about it at the end of this, I'd be happy to take questions. But where this really starts after the discovery of the Rosetta Stone is with Sylvester de Sassi. And he's, you know, at the time, what he was called was an Orientalist, right? So somebody who studied the languages and cultures of the Middle East. And he was an expert in Arabic and Syriac and other languages. And he made some significant discoveries of his own, things like Pahlavi and and other decipherments that he made. And he uh, was working on trying to use these copies of the Rosetta Stone for decipherment of Egyptian. And he made some minor early progress. And then he passed his notes on to one of his students named Johann David Okerblad. We'll talk about him in just a minute. And importantly for our story, he was an early teacher of Champollion himself. Champollion went to Paris to study with de Sassi at one point in his career, and then ultimately they had a falling out and essentially became enemies. We can talk about that a little bit more too. So um, de Sassi was really the first to attempt uh, to use the Rosetta Stone to decipher hieroglyphic and demotic. And he was able to identify, at least partially, some of the names in the Egyptian scripts of the Greek rulers. Um, And so he made some initial progress in this, and then he passed off his work to Okerblad, uh, one of his students. And it was Okerblad who was, in a way, one of the real early geniuses of the decipherment. And he particularly, he worked uh, with the the demotic script in the center of the stone. Um, And he was a Swedish diplomat. He traveled extensively in the the Middle East. Again, he was a colleague in what they called at the time uh, Oriental studies. Um, He had some background in Coptic already. Uh, Coptic was the latest phase of the ancient Egyptian language. So when we talk about the ancient Egyptian language today, we tend to break it up into old Egyptian, middle Egyptian, late Egyptian, Demotic, and Coptic. And those are the main phases that we sort of study as scholars. And Coptic um, came back into the knowledge of European scholars after Athanasius Kircher in the 17th century uh, acquired some bilingual Arabic Coptic manuscripts, and that allowed them to basically um, learn Coptic from those manuscripts. That's when Europeans first um, became acquainted with how to read Coptic. And since Coptic is just a late phase of ancient Egyptian, it plays an important role in the story of decipherment. So Okerblad had some background in Coptic, and he made some real progress with de Sassi's Rosetta Stone materials, mostly using really clever guesswork and then some sort of you know rudimentary methodologies. And so one of the things that uh, he did was, you know, when you had these drawings of the Rosetta Stone, he tried to sort of break out where each word in, in this case, the demotic version of the stone began and ended. And he was also trying to sync them up with the sections in Greek. And in doing so, he was able to identify a number of the alphabetic signs in the demotic, that is the demotic signs that stood for one consonantal sound, because one thing we learn after, out, out of the decipherment is that the Egyptian signs stand for sounds. They're not, it's not sort of a mystical script uh, that reveals the, you know, um, cosmological secrets of the universe, but it's like every other script and language, it stands for sounds. We can talk more about that in a few minutes, but Okerblad was able to de- to determine a number of these uh, values for the demotic script. And you might wonder why the demotic, why not hieroglyphs? Like that's what we're here to talk about. Well, keep in mind that the hieroglyphic section on the Rosetta Stone was only partially preserved, but the demotic section had the most amount of text by which we could compare with the Greek. So if you ask yourself, if you have this as your data set, how would you go about studying this? Well, there's some very simple things you can do. And what these individuals like Okerblad were doing was simply putting the Greek and the demotic next to each other and then looking for repetitions, right? So if in the Greek, the word temple repeated every five lines, 
Well, in theory, every five lines somewhere in this demotic, there should be the Egyptian word for temple. And if the king's name appeared every line in the Greek, the king's name should appear in every line in the demotic, roughly speaking. And so this is what Okerblad was doing. And you can see here are his notes where he's writing the Greek transcription of what he thinks these words are for these demotic signs. And today it's sort of mind-blowing, but he could not read the Egyptian but he could identify using this method a number of the ancient Egyptian words. So, for example, he knew that this set of demotic signs was the word for temple. He didn't know what the word sounded like in ancient Egyptian. He didn't know what the ancient Egyptian word was, but he knew in the script and the demotic script that this group wrote this word. And he was right. And he did that by linking up those repetitions of words or names in the Greek script with where groups repeat it in the Egyptian scripts. So this was a, a fairly big breakthrough early on for Okerblad, and he was able to identify a number of the Greek names, or at least partially, uh, and other some of these words. Even if he didn't know the Egyptian sound of those words, he could identify in the script. And by doing this, he was also able to identify the origin of some of the Coptic letters. So for Coptic, the Egyptians borrowed the Greek script, so it's written in Greek, but there were some sounds in Coptic for which the Greek script didn't have signs, and they made use of demotic signs for those sounds. And it was Okerblad who was able to show, sort of conclusively at least, the origin of these Coptic letters in their earlier demotic equivalents. And so this is sort of what Okerblad had, is a list of some of the values for these demotic characters in addition to the origin of these Coptic uh, signs. And so, for example, this is what we get sort of at the end of Okerblad's work, is that he developed a demotic alphabet of 29 letters, about half of which was correct. So about half of these he identified correctly with their sound values, as we know today. He identified 16 proper names and words, including the, name, the word for temple, Greek, and love, and he recognized what's called the pronominal suffixes for him and his. So these are elements of the Egyptian grammar. In doing so, he made the conceptual leap of realizing that the alphabetical aspect of the demotic script applied to ordinary words, as well as foreign words and proper names. And that's the critical piece of the decipherment, is jumping from understanding that the, the signs stand for sounds but then also not just sounds in foreign names as transcribed, but in other words as well. And that's where really um, Thomas Young and Champollion come into the picture. Champollion, I should say, Thomas Young was really the early leader. He was uh, much older than Champollion, and he got a, a younger, uh, an earlier start um, than this, uh, than Champollion on this. And we should say he was a brilliant genius. He was already making uh, contributions to work in optics. He studied Hebrew, Persian, and Coptic. He connected the Greek and demotic royal names to the hieroglyphic script. So again, Okerblad was really just working with that demotic in the middle of the Rosetta Stone, whereas Thomas Young makes the connection uh, with the cartouches in the hieroglyphic script, which is very important. However, he never made the full leap. He always even to the end, sort of dismissed hieroglyphs as phonetic apart from many of these names and foreign names. And he, he had the key and he just couldn't quite put it together. And we can talk about that a little bit more in a second. And his primary contributions were sort of early in this process leading up to Champollion's decipherment. And of course, there was the great rivalry and even um, accusations that Champollion's work was much more derivative from Thomas Young's work. Um, but then after 1822, it was basically Champollion who took over and then Champollion's successors. So uh, for Thomas Young, uh, I, I also recommend the biography about him that's uh, called The Last Man Who Knew Everything. And I always like to point out that there's now three biographies called The Last Man Who Knew Everything. And one of them is of Athanasius Kircher, the 17th century man who claimed to decipher hieroglyphs incorrectly in the 17th century. And then Again, somebody using it for Thomas Young uh, in the 18th and 19th century. So Thomas Young thought that this should be really easy. <laughs> you know, people were wondering, like, could we ever decipher this? Will the Rosetta Stone help? And from Thomas Young's point of view in this letter that he's writing, he basically is like, I'm astonished that I haven't been able to do it, right? So he, he really thought that this should be easy with the tools that he had available from things like the Rosetta Stone, that this process should um, not be all that 
difficult, but he was still heavily on. And, you know, many people were, it's, this is not just a, uh, about Thomas Young, but they were heavily under the sway of the long tradition of scholarship going back to classical antiquity that saw hieroglyphs as standing for ideas, right? And it was hard to like completely let that go because all the great thinkers of classical antiquity and later told us that's what it meant. So if you looked at Hor Apollo and his book, The Hieroglyphica, or you looked at, um, you know, people like Plutarch and these other uh, classical Greek scholars and Latin scholars, they were telling us hieroglyphs stood for ideas, not sounds. And so Thomas Young was just couldn't quite make the leap to uh, to the real the breakthrough, even though he had a lot of the early clues uh, and important clues to do it. One thing that Thomas Young did that's really remarkable is he published the first translation of the Egyptian section of the of the Rosetta Stone. Now you might ask, well, I thought he didn't have the breakthrough. How did he translate the Rosetta Stone? Well, really what he did is he offered an English paraphrase based on the Greek. So of course he could read the Greek and translate the Greek, and you could put the Greek and the Egyptian scripts next to each other. And then that would allow him to sort of paraphrase the Egyptian version without actually being able to read it. So he was able to publish this in 1814. So this is eight years before the actual decipherment in, uh, in this sort of encyclopedia article, but know that this is not a direct translation. It's sort of a rough paraphrase based on the Greek. And that's basically where he was able to get. He sort of recognized these cartouches. He, he recognized a number of the signs and their phonetic values. He even had the key where he thought he could recognize some Egyptian uh, royal names, but he just never took it to the next step. And that left the door open for Champollion. Now, Jean-Francois Jean Champollion, he was known as the younger Champollion Lejeune uh, because he was the younger of two brothers, uh, Jacques-Joseph Champollion, his older brother, who was very much his mentor and sort of keeper. He was very close with his older brother, um, and his brother really looked after him through, looked after uh, him for most of his life. He was born in Fijac in 1790. He followed his brother around on various academic appointments to places like Grenoble and Paris um, due to various... Uh, political developments in France at the time. He actually got kicked out of Paris for a while um, because of uh, the, the factions between Napoleon and the Royalists and things like that. Uh, he didn't actually make it to Egypt until quite late in his life in 1828, which we'll talk about uh, his expedition with Rossellini to Egypt after the decipherment. And then he died at only 41 years old in 1832. Now, his older brother, was also a quote unquote orientalist. He was studying um, and and a classical scholar. He's studying Greek and he was a librarian in Grenoble and he was a keeper of manuscripts for a time in the National Library and actually tutored uh, Champollion. And Champollion married uh, and had a daughter as well. So Champollion's life mostly takes place in these three cities in France, Fijac, where he was born, Grenoble, where him and his brother worked for a time, and also in Paris, um, where he worked and studied with de Sassi and others, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this is his Champollion's, the door to his childhood home. And I should thank Dave Robbins here for, he went on what looked like an amazing trip um, to France around the uh, the the um the uh the celebration the of the decipherment in September last year and he took all these wonderful pictures here's the hall um that's going down to Champollion's house and right around the corner is what's called inscription square where there's an oversized uh reproduction of the Rosetta stone today you can see the size of it here and just around the corner from that is actually now the Champollion museum which is dedicated to the history of writing so this is sort of where Champollion's life mostly um, takes place. Now, Champollion had an interest in Egyptian and Egyptian hieroglyphs already as a child in Grenoble in 1801. He studied Hebrew, Arabic, and Coptic, and his studying of Coptic would be really critical to the decipherment. And as I mentioned, he studied with de Sassi uh, in Paris. And already in 1807, he had written um, an essay about the geographical description of Egypt. Basically, we're talking about Egyptian place names prior to the decipherment, where he's using Arabic and Greek place names to sort of 
get at the earlier ancient Egyptian names. Um, and he wasn't even really using the Rosetta Stone at this point. He's sort of writing this um, uh, earlier using this um, uh, uh, Arabic and Greek place names to reveal some of the earlier Egyptian materials. And it's this publication that gets him into trouble with Dasasi because Dasasi um, um, writes to another scholar who published on a similar topic, but in a very different way, and uh, basically thinks that Champollion was plagiarizing this other scholar. And he later, Dasasi that is, later, uh, he writes to Thomas Young in 1815 and basically warns Thomas Young, be careful with Champollion, he might steal your ideas. And of course, Champollion wasn't very happy about that. And in fact, if you go back to um, earlier slides in this uh, presentation, when Champollion uh, presented and published his letter to Dossier, he was in, uh, initially going to uh, dedicate it to de Sassi, and then he removed it because of uh, this falling out that they that they had had. So one of the key parts with Champollion and the decipherment is his study of Coptic. And he studied deeply in Coptic, started very early, as I mentioned, uh, when he was very young. But when he went to Paris, he actually started studying with a Coptic priest who was giving mass in Coptic in Paris. So he was an immigrant, he was Egyptian, and he moved to uh, France uh, after the failed Napoleonic uh, invasion. And he was there uh, preaching at a particular church that was just right around the corner uh, from where Champollion was living. And so he was studying with this um, this uh, Coptic priest at the time at this very famous uh, church, which was just a few blocks from his house. And this Coptic priest's name was Shiftishi. And Shiftishi, again, he was born in Cairo. He's Egyptian. He died in France. He was on the payroll of the French government as a translator and working for the French, served as a translator in the, in the Coptic Legion. And he used this pension to support uh, his widows and family members. He lost um, a number of family members in the fighting uh, after the French invasion. So he sort of, you know, really suffered some uh, personal trauma in this, and he was using that French, um, that payment from the French government to support them. But he's also working with Champollion and teaching Champollion. The other person that Champollion works with um, was named Dom Raphael. It's actually seen here in the Red Hood at the uh, coronation of Napoleon. And he's um, Egyptian born, but um, of Syrian ancestry. And he was also working with Champollion to learn Coptic and other languages, Syriac, Arabic, etc. So Champollion's key over Thomas Young was how immersed he was in Coptic. Because remember, Coptic is just the ancient Egyptian language, basically written with Greek characters and these few characters supplemented from Demotic. And so with that knowledge, when he starts working on the Rosetta Stone and he's picking up where Thomas Young left off, where we've already recognized, in fact, since the 18th century, people had guessed that cartouches, and the French word cartouche just means cartridge, that is, this circle looks like a bullet, the cartridge of a bullet, that those encased the royal names of ancient Egyptian kings. So with that little bit of guesswork that people already had, Thomas Young, de Sassi, Okerblad, this is where they were sort of starting, and they could look at the Egyptian scripts on the stone. They could put the Greek name of the king Ptolemy, right? We talked about Ptolemy V as being the king uh, of the decree, and that would give you potentially the sound values for the individual signs in that cartouche. And this guesswork, which was the start of the decipherment, happens to work out. And so when you just take Ptolemy and put it basically one letter after the other, P-T-O-L-M-Y-S, you just can spell out uh, the name of the, the Greek ruler with these Egyptian hieroglyphic signs. And so what this would give you is a hypothesis. The hypothesis would be these signs stand for these sounds. So how can you confirm your hypothesis? Well, you get another cartouche, right? And you see if those uh, sound values work out in that. And so in this case, you have the cartouche, uh, in this case for Alexander, but notice that you have some repeat signs from Ptolemy. You know, you have this curve sign here, you have it here, you have the lion, you have the lion. So because they repeat and you can plug in the same values, it looks like that helps to confirm the hypothesis. Well, you get another cartouche. Here's the cartouche of Caesar 
Kiseris, right? And again, you have that lion, you have that Y, you get another cartouche. Here's Cleopatra. You have the lion, you have the O, you have the P, you have a lot of the same letters from Ptolemy and these other cartouches. And it starts then expanding the sound values that you can assign to these individual hieroglyphic signs. And this was important for Champollion because he used for example, a bilingual inscription on this obelisk that's now called the Banks obelisk to confirm his reconstruction of the uh, Cleopatra cartouche. He thought, oh, it must look like this with these signs in it. And he was able to use the inscription on this obelisk uh, to actually confirm that. So at that point, all you have is a few signs and their sound values. What's the key to jumping to the next, the next part? Well, this is what happened for Champollion. He received copies of an Egyptian inscriptions from a site called Abu Simbel, way in the south, built by Ramses II, a very famous temple. And there were cartouches there. Now, he could guess, following the work of Thomas Young, that the sun disk sign in the cartouche stood for the, for the word Ra, right? The sun god in ancient Egypt. And he knew that the last two signs stood for the sound S, because he had that in that, those um, other cartouches of Ptolemy and Caesar and Alexander. So he knew this said, Ra blank Cess. Well, he knew from reading the classical works that there was a ruler in ancient Egypt whose name was Ramses. So he wondered, maybe this could stand for the sound M for Ramses. Now, I should also say, this is what I hinted at before. Thomas Young already knew this or guessed it but he can never make the next link. So Champollion took that guess, and then he went and looked at another cartouche from these Abu Simbel inscriptions and other inscriptions that he had. And he saw, again, this sign, this sign that I'm using here in the upper left-hand corner of all these slides. And he, again, knew that the ibis was a symbol of the god Thoth, and that this last sign was the sound S. So again, he knew Thoth blank S. And he knew from the classical record that there was an Egyptian king named Tuthmosis, right? So Tuthmosis. It was at that realization that you could plug in these sound values for these signs that for the first time in 1500 years, somebody was reading an ancient Egyptian native name in these cartouches. And it was all based on guessing what the value of this sign was based on this knowledge and knowing that this sign in Coptic stands for the word Messi or Misa in Coptic, Messi in ancient Egyptian, the, the word to give birth, right? So um, that's the word that's in these names. And Champollion already recognized that it often followed personal names. So you would say so-and-so born of so-and-so. And so when he realized this with these cartouches and that this sign had this value, that's when he rushed into his brother's office exclaimed that he had done it and passed out and rested for five days because of the mental toll that it took. But this was the key to then applying these values, not just to the transcriptions of foreign ruler names, but to all kinds of Egyptian words. And this is where Champollion's Coptic training really came into um, fruition, because if you didn't have Coptic, all Champollion would have is the sound of the Egyptian words but not the meaning. But because he had Coptic, he could link up these ancient Egyptian writings like Mess with the Coptic equivalent, Misa, so that he knew actually that this meant to give birth. So knowing Coptic allowed him to actually then translate from the ancient Egyptian scripts, because now he had both the sound value and the meaning of the words. And this was really the main breakthrough. He gave his paper uh, at the Academy and he went on to publish it. It included his transcriptions and identifications of these sounds. And then uh, throughout his life, and actually even after his death, he had three main volumes that he published. The letter, his precise, which is an introduction to the hieroglyphic system, and then finally his Egyptian grammar, which was only published posthumously by his older brother, his older brother took Champollion's notes and put them together and published this after his death. And that was really the grammar that broke it open for the rest of the world. This was what other people learned from. Remember, when this was published in 1836, there were no programs in Egyptology. There was nowhere to go to learn how to read Egyptian. The only way to do it was to study Champollion, which is what his successors did. Champol uh, people like um, 
Carl Ricard Lepsius and Brooks and others studied from Champollion's grammar, taught themselves Egyptian, and then furthered his studies. So a couple key points I want to sort of make about this is number one, Champollion did not only decipher Egyptian hieroglyphs, he also deciphered hieratic and demotic because they work based on the same system of signs. So when he broke this for hieroglyphs, he also broke it for hieratic and demotic and was able to make more advances that set up his successors to be able to decipher these things fully. And so a couple of points um, just to keep in mind is that at Champollion's death, not a single complete text had been translated from beginning to end. So there was a lot of work still left to do for his, his successors. Many of his readings were wrong or conjectural and needed to be correction corrected, and he didn't really fully understand how the signs worked. Uh, and so there was a lot of this work that um, that was left for people taking over the decipherment after Champollion. But one thing that I want to sort of keep in mind um, with this decipherment, even though Champollion's doing this in a sort of imperial context, right, in this uh, clash between France and, and Britain over the control of Egypt, this was the first time that we could actually let the ancient Egyptians speak for themselves, I'll put that in air quotes, and read their own thoughts and desires. And this point was made uh, just recently by Faiza Heichel in that British Museum catalog uh, that's out right now. And so this, for the first time, actually opened up the ancient Egyptians, their thoughts to us uh, for them to express for the first time in basically 1,500 years since the knowledge of ancient Egyptian was lost. So with that, I'll say thank you very much and thank Grace and Glencoe Public Library for inviting me again today. If you have any questions or want to follow up, uh, you can see my email there on the screen. I'd be happy to uh, answer your emails. I'm also happy to take questions right now. And um, I have some other slides, so I'll, I'm going to stop the share for now so we can talk. But if we come to some things, I may turn it back on if you have some particular questions that um, uh, the slides will help for. So thank you very much. Thank you. That was perfection um, for me. Um, <laughs> I never say that actually. Um, th that was so clear and, and comprehensive and just really uh, a really good lecture. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And the illustrations were perfect. Um, um, there are not any questions in the um, Q&A right now. Um, and it may be because we've lost a few people to um, um, the State of the Union address. <laughs> oh, goodness. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't either. <laughs> we knew the date of that when we uh, scheduled this program. Um, somebody did just say something. Yeah, they, they asked, yeah. Uh, could they send a list of books that I recommend uh, with the link? And I, I would be happy to do that. I, I did have a few um, at the end here. Uh, I could just talk very briefly. I mean, there's a oh, few on the biography of Champollion uh, that are um, that are worth reading. I would say the Andrew Robinson book in the middle is maybe um, one of the most popular, but I, I do really like this newer, The Riddle of Rosetta. Uh, this really delves into Champollion's uh, archives a lot more, and you get um, a sort of much deeper detailed sense of Champollion, his life, and what he's doing. Uh, if you want more overviews, here's a couple. Back in 1999, the British Museum, again, uh, they published this book, Cracking Codes. So think about that, 1999. It was the bicentennial of the discovery of the Rosetta Stone in 1799. So uh, the British Museum's on top of uh, this <laughs> promoting with the Rosetta Stone. Um, and then the biography of Thomas Young, I mentioned. And then A History of Egyptology by Jason Thompson. There are a few books about Napoleon in Egypt that are worth reading, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, that we have um, the perception of um, an Arabic writer who's writing in Arabic in Paris at the same time. An Imam in Paris is a very interesting book to get a different perspective, a non-European perspective on this, as well as um, El Dali's book about previous attempts to decipher Egyptian in the works of scholars writing in Arabic, uh, mostly in the medieval period. And there's some really interesting stuff with that. They they never sort of also sort of cracked the code, but they were making attempts and they obviously had 
you know, scholars in Egypt had act, direct access to the original monuments and they're making copies and they're trying to figure it out. So that's a really interesting uh, part of it as well. But uh, back to the question, I can very happily send a list of these books uh, to Grace and uh, can send them out with the link. Oh, thank you. That would that would be great. Um, also, please, um, uh, did you say that there's a link online to the um, catalog for the, the current British Museum ex exhibition? Or is that you, sale only? No. Sale only. Okay. Correct. Sale yeah. only. At least, is, at least for now. Okay. But then there's that article in the... Uh, I have it right here. Books. <laughs> 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 Looks good. Um, there's also the review in the London Review of Books. Um, um, and maybe, maybe you could send that to me and we could send that out to um, sure. e Egypt Explorations. Or, I didn't get the whole title. Yeah, I can, I can send. Which Rosetta? That one. Yes, that's the, yeah. um, that's the lecture um, by my colleague about sort of Egyptian perspectives of this, which we, mm -hmm. I, I sort of ran out of time, so we didn't get to uh, speak about it as much, but I can send all of those links out. I was actually going to mm -hmm. um, just grab one right now too, because I can put it in the chat. So here's the link to that lecture on YouTube, uh, the Witch Rosetta lecture. Oh, thank and you. Uh, we can put that there. You, can, you might also want to look up, um, I'll put her name in the chat here, Ilona Regulski. She's the curator at the British Museum. So if you just search her on YouTube, for example, there's a number of also really good uh, lectures similar to mine, in fact, about the Rosetta Stone, about the exhibit. I'll put another one of those here um, for those of you who want that link. Um, and she has a couple of um, uh, lectures about the exhibit out. I'll put one more. Don't want to overwhelm you, but just uh, I can I can offer a few things. No, thank you. And, yeah. and uh, to everyone who's watching, we will, we have a way of taking those things that were in chat and we'll pull them from that and send it to you in the email when we send the, the link to the recording. So you'll sure, have, you'll have uh, enough Egyptian uh, studies to keep you occupied for years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, secondly, uh, there are, there are a few questions now, yep. um, but before we get into it, I just wanted to put in a plug to everyone. If you have not already been to the art, the Oriental Institute down in Hyde Park, it is a jewel of a museum. Um, it's bigger than you'd expect. And it's just, it's a great way to spend a winter afternoon. Um, I, I really recommend it. And, and so, I double that recommendation. <laughs> and I can just say we do have a special exhibit on right now that's um, that's about statues that were discovered in Libya. So this is uh, Libya in Northern Africa. Uh, these are copies of earlier classical sculptures. So there's lots of interesting uh, ways to uh, interpret them, uh, but the exhibits really focuses on, they were discovered during excavations carried out by the OI. Uh, and so it's about contextualizing those statues in their urban environment where they were discovered. And that's called Making Sense of Marbles. So that was uh, co-curated uh, between Kirsten Newman and um, Rocco, uh, who's do, who curated that. And that's still on display, although not for much longer. And we have a new special exhibit that's going up, I believe, in late March um, that will be going up uh, then. But I don't want to reveal that before they're ready. Oh, great, thank you. Now, now there are a whole bunch of questions in, in the Q and A. Um, I will take as many as we can, but we do need to um, uh, let you back to your evening. So um, we'll we'll ha we'll do a few. Um, somebody Dexter asks um, if hypothetically Champollion did not crack the Rosetta Stone, which scholar later could you speculate would have done? It's so hard to say. I mean, because in in all probability, it would have been somebody that at this point, we've never heard of, you know, I, I don't think it would have necessarily been like, for example, Lepsius, Carl Lepsius, who was the sort of what I call the successor to Champ, one of the successors to Champollion, one of the major ones, who knows if he would have been looking at this stuff without Champollion's grammar and you know, sort of who would have been working around it at the time. And in fact, maybe Thomas Young would have done it if uh, Champollion hadn't beaten him to it, um, even though he was sort of slowing down in his studies of, of Egyptian at the time, because he wasn't really making more progress. He had the key. He knew that he could read Ramses in that cartouche. That was his guess. Um, but he just never extrapolated it to the rest of the language. Um, but the reality is, I don't know. Who knows? It could have been a lot of different people. Um, the obvious answer would be Thomas Young. Um, but there were a lot of very 
brilliant people around. Uh, you think about like Okerblad, the Swedish diplomat that I mentioned. Um, there were a lot of people like that who could have very well broken broken that with the Rosetta Stone. And we should also say, um, you know, after the Napoleonic invasion, Egypt really opened up for Europe and and even for the Americas. And this set off a wave of what we now today call Egyptomania, where architecture is being influenced and drawings and picture uh, drawings and paintings of Egyptian monuments are circulating all around in books. And then also lots and lots of Egyptian monuments themselves, because it's the French and British who are working in Egypt who build up their own collections and then sell them back to the main institutions in Europe. It's how Paris, London, um, uh, and in Italy, how the, the major collections were built. So it could have been a lot of different people, to be honest, hard, hard to guess which one. Thank you. Um, uh, Stuart asks you, uh, for your thoughts on why hieroglyphs were for so long thought to represent ideas rather than sounds. Yeah, I mean, this is the really interesting thing. It's mm. because they do. So this is the, the, the trick of Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's a complicated writing system. And so you can use a sign as what we call an ideogram or a logogram. That is, you draw a picture of something. So let's take the sun, and it stands for the sun. But then through something that we call uh, in linguistics the rebus principle, <laughs> you can take that same image and use it just for that sound. So it doesn't mean the sun anymore. It just stands for the sound ra, for example, or like we saw with the little group of foxtails that I showed you that stands for mess to be born. You can just use that sign then for that sound. The other thing that complicates it for Egyptian is that they don't write the vowels. So all of those word signs and, and phonetic signs are just the consonants. So you have signs that stand for whole words that are just basically identifying, let's say, three consonants. So because you can use those signs logographically, that is for those ideas, you know, the words themselves, as the knowledge of the script faded out in the 3rd, 4th, 5th century AD, um, that is the part that actually lived on and had some credence to it. So even if you look at Horapollo's Hieroglyphica, so this is the most famous uh treatise on hieroglyphs from the pre-modern period, um, or okay, one of them, but probably the most famous. People think it was written sometime around four or 500 AD. Um, even though he's only talking about hieroglyphs as standing for ideas, some of the ideas they stand for, he's right about, right? So he says, for example, the vulture sign stands for the mother, which it does. It writes the word for mother, but then he gives a false etymology. He says, you know, because I don't know, like vultures, uh, they're only females. There's no males in the species or something like that, which of course is a totally wrong explanation, but it's the right idea. The vulture does write the word for mother. And so one way that I tend to think about how this worked is that probably people, classical scholars writing in Greek and Latin, they were living and visiting in Egypt. And what would they do? They would take tours like a tourist. Well, what's the Egyptian tourist guide when you go to the site going to tell you about. I, and I'll just say I've had this experience myself. You know, I've gone to Egypt with tours uh, for the University of Chicago and people do this. They say, oh, what does that say? You know, they want you to read it because they think how, how cool is it that you can read hieroglyphs? Well, when you start actually reading what it says, it turns out to be kind of boring <laughs> and people's eyes glaze over. So what instead do you tell them? You give them the gist, right? And you tell them bits and pieces that you can understand. So what I tend to think is that you know, we have some examples in the classical literature about these tours. Even uh, Roman emperors went on these tours and they had Egyptian guides explaining things to them. They were probably telling them some of these ideas to sort of be interesting. And that's what caught on in some of the classical literature that then is what survived uh, in terms of uh, being copied over and over. Um, so I think that's one reason that that idea persisted so long is that that's what was being transmitted in, let's say, 4th, 5th century AD. And then everybody's taking those scholars' word as like authoritative. And so it took until Champollion to sort of overturn that. Sorry, you see one question. I'm very long-winded. I, I tend to <laughs> No, talking. no, it's, it's not a simple explanation. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, okay. We're only going to do two more questions, but first I want to put in a very nice little comment from Catherine, who comes to lots of our programs, and she says, the lecture was very dense and yet very clear, so engaging, absolutely fabulous. So, well, thank you. I appreciate that, Catherine. Thank you. 
Um, and then uh, also Donna, who I also know, um, said, this is an amazing lecture. I always thought the Rosetta Stone was the one and only. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so, thank you, Donna. Okay, two questions, and then I'm going to let you go for the sure. night. Um, uh, Elizabeth asks, um, did any of the other decree stones that you identified have a similar mix of languages, and did they play a role in translating um, ancient Egyptian? Yeah, so most of the other decrees I mentioned were like the Rosetta Stone. They were trilingual. Mm -hmm. They were hieroglyphic. Middle Egyptian. So remember, I'm using two terms, hieroglyphic for the script, Middle Egyptian for the phase of the language, Demotic for both the script and the language, and then Greek for both the script and the language. Most of those Ptolemaic decrees that I showed you, not all of them, but the majority of them were trilingual. So number one, yes, most of those other decrees had trilingual inscriptions. And yes, they were important uh, fairly early on in translating Egyptian, but not as much as the Rosetta Stone, because of course their discoveries came later. So some of the decrees that I showed you, they weren't even discovered, let's say, until the early 20th century. So a couple of them were known and they were uh, important in the decipherment. Um, process, the larger process, because what happened after Champollion is, you know, certain scholars worked on certain areas, um, you know, so for example, a scholar named Brooks, very famous for working on demotic, sort of picking up where Champollion and Okerblad left off and, and furthering study of the demotic script, whereas Lepsius uh, was very famous for figuring out some things with the hieroglyphic script that Champollion did not know that then was furthered by uh, their successor. So they did play a role, but much more limited than the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was sort of the breakthrough. And then with these expeditions going to Egypt, I mentioned only very briefly, Champollion himself went to Egypt. And when he came back, um, they produced large, lavish volumes of all these drawings and copies of inscriptions. All of that stuff became important because now you could re read bits and pieces and compare inscriptions from different places. And that was really critical in the furthering process, right? Because Champollion's basically working from a handful of sources. He had the Rosetta Stone, he had that Banks obelisk, and then the key was he got these new inscription copies from Abu Simbel. But after the decipherment, after 1822, there was so much more material available that those other decrees played a role, but a, mi a minor one. Okay, thank you. And related to that is a question from Roger, um, who who says, you made it clear that Champollion made some limited progress in deciphering hieroglyphics, but his work was incomplete. When were they finally de deciphered? Can we say now that we can translate hieroglyphics? I mean, you can try, can, is, is the process complete? Is our knowledge filled out? I mean, I mean the, the short answer is no. There, every day, all the time, we are figuring out new readings. Uh, for signs there and words and different parts in various scripts. I mean, demotic, for example, is it's an area that I work in and it's sort of famous for being difficult. Uh, and there's there's plenty of text in demotic that right now no one in the world can fully read. They're just that difficult. We just don't know every little squiggle, what it means, what it's supposed to mean. And also the Egyptians are sort of playing with the signs and making it difficult for us. But let me, I will say this though, I don't want to give the wrong impression. So the process is still ongoing. But with that said, it's actually remarkable for some simple things. If you go back to Champollion, again, this is just for bits and pieces, but there are passages we would translate basically exactly the same today, right? So that's how much he was able to break through uh, with what he did. He, Of course, he didn't understand it as deep linguistically or, or all the different constructions, but there are some things where we basically would translate it exactly the same, but it's an ongoing process. I, I would say, however, to go back to, and not to, you know, I want to answer Roger. I don't want to just give him a non-answer. Really, uh, the, the main um, turning point was the 1880s, 1890s period, where you had a school that developed in Berlin under a Egyptologist named Adolf Ehrmann, and he had him and his students, people like Kurt Zeta and very famously, James Henry Breasted, the founder of the Oriental Institute where I work today. He studied with Ehrmann and Zeta in Berlin and Ehrmann and Zeta, they were really focused on studying the language and they really opened things up. A lot of our modern um, nomenclature, a lot of our modern transliteration scheme. And when I say transliteration, that is putting the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs into sort of Romanized characters uh, derived from that period. That was when our first um, major publication developed, a, a publication that's called the Zeitra for Egyptische Sprache. That was when that developed. So really the sort of 
let's say the maturing of the discipline of Egyptology was in the second half of the 19th century. And that's really when, again, we are making new progress all the time, but the big core of it was sort of uh, established. Okay, thank you. In just 30 more seconds. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanna know for my, for my own sake, how did you get into Egyptology? Yeah, uh, I actually, I got into Egyptology because I was interested initially in the origin of civilization. So I was actually interested in Mesopotamia and the Sumerians and the very earliest periods in, in ancient Egypt and sort of basically looking at where did this come from, right? <laughs> where did our societies, where did what we call quote unquote civilization, how did it begin? Uh, but then as I get it, I got into it and you start learning more about it, you know, at the beginning, I knew nothing, right? <laughs> and uh, But as I started learning more about it, you get pulled in these different directions. And uh, it's hard to come to Chicago. We're very well known. Uh, we're famous in the field for our, our study of demotic. We have a project that's called the Chicago Demotic Dictionary, which is edited by Janet Johnson and Brian Muse, who are currently professors here. And when you come here to study in graduate school, it's hard not to get pulled in those directions. So it started out as sort of an interest in origins, but then really morphed into, um, to be honest, the, one of the things that I love the most is I love looking at something that nobody's read in thousands of years and being the first to read it. And uh, I just had this experience recently. I went to California to a collection, a, a, a librarian called me and said, hey, we found an Egyptian papyrus we didn't know we had. Like, do you think it's interesting? <laughs> and I looked at it and I was like, yeah, it's interesting. And I, and I went there and that to me is just such a exciting and fun thing to be able to do, right. To take this knowledge that we've, we've built up studying this stuff and be able to sit down with, you know, a 15 foot hieratic papyrus in front of you and read it uh, for the first time that nobody else knows what it is. Uh, that's really what sort of fires my excitement about it. Well, it comes through in your lecture. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It was great to be here. Thanks so much. Um, perhaps we'll get you in-house someday and, and we can learn more from you. Absolutely. So, All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Scoff. And thank you for everyone who watched tonight. Good night. Yeah. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.